All right, last call. It's been a long night and we've had a good time, but what do you say we crack open one more for the road before we close? We'll be viewing the final death of Laura Bow and then in the many deaths of Laura Bow graveyard filler special. We'll be taking a look at the influence that the new things that Laura Bow had on games and Laura's legacy. And we'll take a closer look at the final two cast members tonight, Clarence Sparrow and Henri Dijon. Buckle up, let's get through this. Alright, this is it, the moment you've all been waiting for. The final death of Laura Bow. Well, we know that we've had the valve and the crank for a long time, so we could have opened the secret passage in the garden since basically like Act 3. However, we weren't able to light the lantern. What happens if we take a step down? Does the murderer get us? Does Laura lose her foot? And oh my gosh, she really dramatically loses her step, tumbles down in a perfect set of spirals, and perishes. This last death, I'm afraid, is going to be totally mediocre. I give it a three in terms of both fairness and atmosphere. Uh, in terms of fairness, yeah, it's dark, and generally in adventure games you don't enter dark places without a light, but the getting of the matches is so arbitrary that it's hard to really give that any more than a three. And in terms of atmosphere, yeah, it's a spooky old house. Um, I guess this establishes that underground zone is sort of a dangerous area, which, you know, it's an important one, so that helps a little bit, but nothing too special. Well, that is it, everybody. We have filled the graveyards with Laura clones, and we now know every possible way for Laura to die in-game. Let's move on. So let's talk influence. Let's talk legacy. Why is the Colonel's Bequest an important game? What did it add to the history of gaming, and how did it change things? Now, I'm going to start off by saying this section is going to be one of the more subjective ones. I don't have a lot of interviews or work cited pages which directly say, oh, the Colonel's Bequest influenced our project in the following ways. So this is mostly going to be supposition on my part. Some of it may be accurate, some of it not. However, I think I, think I can make a good case based on the timing, the pedigree, and the content of the Colonel's Bequest, that it was, it was a fairly important game, that it might have changed a few things. First, in terms of the pedigree, uh, in terms of the development team behind it, I think we can say that the people who made it went on to be fairly influential in games. Obviously, the development team uh, was mostly Ken and Roberta Williams. Those were powerhouses behind uh, adventure games in the 80s and 90s. The Sierra era of adventure games is, is still sort of cited as the golden age of adventure games. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the things that they would go on and try to put in their other games, a lot of the ideas, I think very clearly came through in The Colonel's Bequest. Um, the Colonel's Bequest was a, a project sort of from the heart from Roberta Williams, who really wanted to make a murder mystery game and really wanted to make something different within this medium that she had already sort of mastered, the adventure game. Now, because it was produced by Sierra, it got widespread enough distribution that the ideas in it would have spread out, been played, been seen by other games developers, and would have filtered through and become more, more accepted, more prevalent as time went on. Now, again, this isn't to say that this is the only place that those ideas were coming from, or that this was the, the origin of them, that nothing influenced the Colonel's bequest, but it certainly was a step in the right direction. Now, what are the elements that I'm saying it was a step in the right direction toward? Well, let's look at, specifically, what the Colonel's Bequest does differently from other games. In order to get a better feel for the ideas it was putting forward, let's see, let's see what it did differently. The first thing that might jump out at you as we've played through this game is a sense of limited, primitive maybe, non-linearity. And what I mean by that is... There is not a single path through this game which you either die or do the right thing. And that was very common in games before then. Even in things like RPGs. Sure, there would be some leveling, you could go out and grind and maybe do some side quests. But there was really only one progression through the game. Of course, in adventure games, this is taken pretty much to its extreme. You pick up the correct things, solve the correct puzzles, and move forward in the correct way. It's not so much like that in the Colonel's Bequest. There is an ending, which you can get to. There is obviously a beginning that's the same for everybody. But your path through the night might be different from player to player and game to game. I think you can see this reflected very clearly in the two runs that I've showed so far. Our main one is sort of this omniscient psychic run in which we know everything, we see everything, we're in the right place at all the right times, and everything sort of falls into place for us. 
the other run that I showed you quickly is uh, is the extreme opposite, an ignorance run, in which we discover basically nothing, no side plots except that Fifi was kissing the colonel. We witness no deaths and see no rooms out of order. We get to at least the very end of the game having no idea that murders have even been taking place. And the interesting thing is, that's still an ending. It's not like Laura dies uh, or the game considers it to be a bad ending or it gives you a game over. You can still reach the end. Now, it's not exactly true non-linearity because, like I say, we all have the same beginning, we all have the same end. But it's certainly a step towards that direction. And it's one I think we can see reflected very well in Mass Effect 3. Has a has sort of a similar idea. And, and the Mass Effect series in general, but Mass Effect 3 in particular. In Mass Effect 3, you want to build up a resource, which is war preparedness or, or you know, weapons and resources to fight this war. The decisions you make along the way will impact whether you have more or fewer resources. They're all considered valid choices by the game that allow you to progress forward, but at the end, you're sort of graded in a way based on how well or ill prepared you are. Uh, leaving out discussions about the satisfaction of the Mass Effect 3 ending, it, you do generally want to have more resources as opposed to fewer. It's kind of the same thing in The Colonel's Bequest, except instead of war resources, we're collecting clues and plots as we move forward in the game. Uh, when We'll be, in a, in a way, graded on them when we reach the end. It, it's the same thing in Lore Boat 2. So that is one element that it does fairly well. The other is a focus on personality as opposed to just gameplay. Even in a lot of adventure games to this point, a lot of the gameplay had been basically moving objects in the correct way to solve puzzles. It had been, a, it had been basically a string of puzzles uh, put together with graphics in there. Uh, and RPGs had been sort of slow tactical simulators, uh, or the ability to build a party and fight a battle, which would progress you through the game. Obviously, sports games were, you know, the skill to advance, um, the skill to defeat your enemies in whatever sport it was. The Colonel's Bequest did something a little bit different. The skill that you were looking for wasn't necessarily a game. It wasn't necessarily a game of skill so much as it was a game of personality, a game of intuition. I think something that we've seen is that we have reached the second to last chapter, and there's still some debate among people about who they think the murderer might have been, or who the murderers might have been if there, if there was more than one. So something that's very interesting in this game is it requires us to use a very different part of our brains, as opposed to sort of this challenge overcoming mechanism. We need to look at the people. We need to use the social centers of our brains and determine, okay, who do we think in this scenario would be telling a lie? Who do we think would be telling the truth? There have been a rash of games lately which play on this very mechanic, and there have been a few um, all throughout gaming history, but just recently I can specifically think of Heavy Rain and L.A. Noir, which are both sort of mystery games. Uh, I guess that's probably the medium to which this is most closely associated. But a lot of games, uh, even beyond the idea of just mysteries, of focusing more on the personalities of the characters. And that is something that, while well, again, I can't say the Colonel's Bequest started that, it certainly featured very heavily in the Colonel's Bequest. So it, it being a successful game was a, an argument for more of that kind of thing and a movement towards it. Uh, the final thing that the Colonel's Bequest did that I think we can see reflected in more games is that it tried to create a living, breathing world which our character inhabits, but which is not totally determined by her position and what she has accomplished. What I mean by this is we can see this in a lot of, well, many games, adventure games do this very well, and I've mentioned RPGs a lot, but action games too. You move through a game and there are triggers which are set, and those, those activate different things to happen in the game world. Uh, this is sort of famously in RPGs. You know, you'll, you'll come up to somebody and they will say, oh, we really need this thing to happen right away, this is really crucial that this happens, and you go, okay, I'll go right and do it. Uh, and if it's part of the main quest, say, in Skyrim or something like that, I'll get to that first main quest, and the person will be, oh, this is really vital that we do this, and I'll say, okay, and I'll come back, like, two years later in game time. I mean, two years later. You know, by that point in time, I'm in charge of the Fighters Guild, the Mages Guild, the Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, I've done everything that there is possible to do. And they're still like, oh, thank goodness you're here, you're just barely here in time. You know, the world is very clearly just revolving around the player. As opposed to, in the Colonel's Bequest, there's this idea that things are happening, whether we're there for them or not. I discovered in the Ignorance LP 
that there's actually a timer put uh, on some conversations and some things that happen in the game, where if you take too long, the game's clock is keeping track of how long you take, and if you take too long, people will leave the rooms and, and go back up to their other rooms, and so you can miss whole conversations. I would have to, uh, because I did not want to you know, hear certain conversations in the ignorance run, I would wait out in the lobby for a while, and sure enough, after a while, people would leave the rooms and, and go to the next place that they were going to go. So... You're not the center of this of this world. You can make yourself the center by being in the right place at the right time, but it's going to move forward whether you're on this or not. And this is something I, I think we can see uh, happening more and more in games, especially ones that want to create an immersive environment and want us to have the idea that you know we're not this invulnerable action hero, that things are happening around us. The one that comes to mind most easily for me would be uh, the Dead Rising series, in which we're given a number of triggers and we're told when things are going to happen and there's sort of a clock that's counting down and whether we use our time wisely and rescue people and you know kill zombies or uh, you know do whatever goals we might have or whether we just sort of sit in a corner and drink orange juice we're going to get to the end of that and at the end we're either we've either done well or we've not done well but we get to the end either way so those three elements in particular the idea of a character based story a world which moves forward, whether you know, we're ready for it or not, and a sort of non-linear narrative. All of these three ideas, which I think we can find a lot of traction in modern games, and which are sort of very hot ideas now, were being done, and being done fairly well by the Colonel's Bequest way back in 1989. Uh, again, you know, this was all suppositional, and nobody is citing this directly, but I, I think that the Colonel's Bequest was an argument for all of these elements that we have seen be very important in adventure gaming. So, that's just my theory. If you have your own, I'd be happy to hear it in the thread. But I think that is why The Colonel's Bequest is an important game. The character Clarence Sparrow is almost certainly based off of Clarence Darrow, who was a real-life lawyer in America's history. This is probably about as far as we get from a real person to their portrayal in the game. You know, if you remember... Clara Bow was sort of close to Laura Bow. Lillian Gish had some similarities with Lillian Prune, so they tend to base people off of characters that are like them. Clarence Darrow, on the other hand, is almost nothing like Clarence Sparrow, except for, as I said, being a lawyer. Uh, Clarence Seward Darrow was born April 18th, 1857. He was a very famous lawyer and a leading member of the ACLU. He was known for a number of cases throughout his career. Mostly, uh, they were charity cases in which he defended people that were considered to be disenfranchised or against the system. As I said, he was born in uh, Ohio, in rural northeastern Ohio, 1857. He was the son of Amaris Darrow and Emily Darrow. Both of them were sort of free thinkers. Emily was an early feminist, and Amaris Darrow was known as the village infidel. He was an iconoclast and was a religious free thinker. Clarence was interested in law and passed the bar and became a lawyer first in Youngstown, Ohio. He opened his practice in Andover and moved around Ohio. He was always involved in the Democratic Party and in liberal causes in general, and his and his career really took off when he moved to Chicago with his wife, Jessie, and had his son, Paul. It was there that he began a career as a corporate lawyer defending Chicago Northwestern Railway Company and made, him, made a name for himself as a corporate lawyer, which is somewhat opposite of the image he has today. This really changed in 1894 when he represented Eugene Debs, the leader of the American Railway Union. He was prosecuted for a strike against the railroads, and this required Darrow to sever, basically sever his ties with the railroad. This was a huge financial sacrifice. After this, he became one of America's leading labor attorneys. He helped organize the Populist Party in Illinois and ran for Congress as a Democrat uh, unsuccessfully. His marriage at this time also ended in divorce, and so he moved into being more of a career-driven person at this time, although he did eventually remarry Ruby Hammerstorm, a young Chicago journalist. He was a very popular labor attorney for a while, being called to handle a lot of cases uh, dealing with labor, but he was eventually charged of bribery and trying to influence jurors, which caused the Labor, labor Party to drop him some, from their list of preferred jurors. This made him go commercial again, and he began defending murder crimes especially. At this time, he became convinced that the criminal justice system in America was in some way fundamentally broken and biased against those who didn't have the money or resources to defend himself. He was probably most famous for taking the case of Leopold and Loeb, 
the teenage sons of two wealthy Chicago families who were accused of kidnapping and killing Bobby Franks, a 14-year-old from their stylish neighborhood. This was not famous for getting them acquitted of the murders which they admitted to, but for preventing the death sentence, something which he had dedicated his career to opposing. His closing argument in this particular case became very famous. It was sort of a popular bestseller. Uh, copies of it were printed and issued, and it sold extremely well. He was famous for defending many other murders, but the one thing you might know him for, more than anything else, is the Scopes trial. That took place in the state of Tennessee versus Scopes. It, w it had to do with a local teacher teaching evolution, when the official state policy at that time was to not teach evolution, but creationism. He went up against William Jennings Bryan. Both of them were sort of celebrity lawyers, and in fact, there is a lot of evidence that the town essentially manufactured this trial as sort of a tourist trap. So, these were two celebrity lawyers who, given, both probably believed in their sides, arguing in this extremely publicized and hyped up trial. The court eventually sided with William Jennings Bryan, however, popular opinion held that Clarence Darrow had ar argued him, and so he sort of went down in history. This was popularized in the later movie Inherit the Wind. So to summarize, Clarence Darrow was a well-respected, humanitarian, liberal lawyer from American history who is remembered for opposing the death penalty, being a labor lawyer, and arguing for teaching evolution in schools, while in the game Clarence Sparrow is just sort of a scummy lawyer. He steals money from Henri. He was my prime suspect for a lot of the murders so far uh, until his untimely death, or you might call it timely if you don't like him a lot, and was just sort of a scumbag with not any real redeeming features. We did have one sort of nice conversation with him, but Clarence Sparrow is miles away from the smooth, eloquent country lawyer who pursues humanitarian ends that Clarence Darrow was. So, Colonel Dijon. Let's go over what we know about him. He was somewhat of a war hero in the Spanish-American War, having there attained his rank of colonel. He risked his own life to get soldiers back behind friendly lines, taking bullets, which put him out of commission. That made him sort of a local hero. However, he has since become sort of soured on humanity, doesn't like anyone, and chooses to live alone with a small group of servants in the middle of a swamp. He is fantastically wealthy, but also known for being sort of a miser. Called everyone here tonight and has been sort of mysterious ever since the beginning of the game. We haven't had any good conversations with him. All of our conversations have centered around basically, you know, him telling us to get out of his room or to get away. We have picked up a few clues about him, though. It is possible that in the past he was a nicer person. We learned this from Lillian, who has good memories of her time with him. We don't know if those are accurate or not. It's possible he was nice, though. We know that he cares for his sister, Ethel, and that her drinking disturbs him and that he tried to help her out by watching Lillian when they were when she was a kid. We also know that he's apparently able to get around much better than we might think uh, based on him being wheelchair bound. We know he can at least walk. He has been seen walking with a cane, but he actually abandoned the cane in a secret passage. This also leads us to believe that he has been spying on everyone tonight. So what are the true motives of Henri? Well, we're not quite sure, but we seeing as this is the second to last chapter, we're probably going to find out real soon. Henri is another character I couldn't really find any motivation for, uh, or any archetypes that he was based off of in film of the 1920s, or any particular characters from history or anything like that, so it could be that he is another unique character. I have to make a confession that I actually did not realize Colonel Dijon is just a, a fancy way of saying Colonel Mustard from Clue, until maybe the third page of this LP, when somebody was like, oh, I couldn't believe I didn't know that before. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you didn't know that. Um, but so that's that's his only influence, and obviously the characters in Clue aren't especially well fleshed out, so it's hard to go into too much detail about that, other than, I guess, they're both colonels. So that is a, t a look at the lawyer and the leader of the evening, and that is it for the final after hours. Well, I want to say thanks, everybody, for sticking with me through all these. It's been just a ton of fun to do, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all in future LPs. All right, take care.